It's Yatsik. Ya Yatsik. J. It's Jasic. <laughs> it's Jasic. <laughs> with Graham Patina. I'm sitting here with my longtime, really good friend, Yatsik of Tropical Watch. Um, feel free to introduce yourself a little bit. I obviously uh, speak very highly of you and have never said anything bad about you ever. Jason. <laughs> Do you have a website? <laughs> <laughs> is this going to be the whole thing? Okay, the whole thing is just going to yeah. be us razzing each other. Why would you even say anything bad about me? I, I wouldn't. Um, I said on proof. It, it, it's on camera. It's proof. <laughs> it's proof. Um, hi. <laughs> I'm a watch dealer. Uh, and <laughs> I'm joking. No, I've been a watch dealer for a long time. Uh, since the mid-2000s. Um, and I think that, I don't know if when we were like talking earlier, it has changed. You know, like everything has changed. You know, the, because before... The big difference was there was no Instagram. There was the internet and there was chat rooms and forums that we kind of like were on. But even the best things that you would find, it, it didn't even matter because there wasn't really even like a client for them, you know? Right. And in the beginning, we were mostly selling to European customers. So that was like the crazy thing. Like we were flying the watches domestically and pretty much 80% of them were sold to like Europe. So when, so did, when did Asia get into the, into the mix? Um, I think in the late 2000s, it was sort of like slowly but surely, I think the kind of market opened. And I think it really coincided with sort of not so much that there weren't any collectors in Hong Kong or in Japan. I think that you just became more comfortable about buying stuff um, and buying from like dealers outside the country. And then later on, I think in the early like... In I don't know, I'm, I'm, this is all kind of made up because I wasn't paying attention when, it, when the shifts happened. Sure. But in like around 2012, 2013, other countries that maybe didn't even collect watches before started kind of coming into the space. And, and so for, for the first time ever, we started having customers from Thailand or Malaysia and Indonesia. And um, not so much ever like anyone from like China, just because I think that it was, it's really hard to import watches there. Um, but but it, it shifted. It shifted to like to other countries that like weren't really kind of a pay attention to stuff. And I think what happened is as countries have matured and as new money became older money, I think that people sort of like first, the first thing they do is want to buy something shiny and new. And then as other people are started coming up too and they're buying the shiny new things, they sort of want to differentiate themselves and they wanted to buy something different. And but so, I think that's, the, that's a natural progression for almost every single country that you see go through an economic boom, and yeah. you get into that, the different stages of uh, collections. But you, know, you mentioned Indonesia, Malaysia, there's some of the biggest collectors out there, or, or the collections are out there right now. I think that, and, and I think that they're a little more vocal in showing, or kind of not vocal, but like you could see the progression of their collections grow much faster because they did it in the limelight. While you know, there's customers and collectors and 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 like crazy, crazy collections that have been put together with no one knowing that they've existed. Sure. But uh, but I think what's happened is this kind of ability to share and the ability to kind of get excited about something new. And it sort of it makes it makes, for example, like the the Vintage Rolex Asylum, like the Indonesian like kind of group of people that came together and were kind of really showed off what they were getting, and and it kind of made a lot of other people excited about it too. So. Um, yeah, it's different. It's 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 better because now maybe it's harder to find really great watches, but it's but it's very easy to sell them. You know, like the the, the before it was very easy to buy watches and then very difficult to sell them, and then and it shifted so, in a very dramatic way. Right. So the market overall has grown. More people are uh, understand the value of these things, which makes the price go up a little bit, um, and also you have a larger audience, obviously, due to yeah. your exposure in what, GQ and Houdinki and yeah, all the other... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like we started doing this before Houdinki was a thing, you know, um, before there was a blog and before a lot of these things existed. And, and really back in the day, it was really just forums. So 
Tell me a little bit about that first publication. You said the SF Chronicle. Oh yeah, so I saw an article in, um, in the Chronicle about um, secret shops. And back in the day, the, the, the store that we had was, was private, so you have to have an appointment to come in. And so I emailed them, I was like, hey, look, I know you're doing a story about like secret shops. Um, we kind of have one of those too. And so they're like, oh, that's interesting. Let's do, let's do an interview with them. Um, and so we, um, they emailed me some questions and then they came over and then they kind of did like just an interview that we didn't think was gonna lead to anything. Um, and what happened was we got printed in like a, like a print magazine. So instead of just having like little things online, we've, we've reached a completely different audience that was really just localized to the Bay Area. When, when was this? Oh, I think it was like 2007, 2008. Like the crazy thing about all this stuff is like you don't really pay attention when it's happening because you don't really think it's significant and hindsight becomes like a lot more significant. Right. Um, but, but, uh, but then for years, like I was telling you, for years, people were like three years, five years, six years later, they would come with the printed out article that they got in a newspaper and then they showed us, like they brought a watch to sell. And, but the first time they saw that anything was valuable or, any, that, or that there was a collectible market for this was sort of that print article in the Chronicle. So we got a, really, a lot of really cool things. And I think also too, the people that were selling it got really high prices for the things that they were selling because they didn't just bring it to a local store which would just back in the day, not, there wasn't enough information to know if you were getting a good deal, if you're selling it for a high price. There isn't the same kind of level of access to information as there sure. is now. So um, it worked for everybody. When do you think it became, I mean, do you think vintage Rolex, vintage watches in general today are mainstream? Or if not, when did it become mainstream? I think that's a, that's a, you know, like I think the general population of people that live, work, and do stuff in the world don't really know about watches, don't know that they're very expensive. But I think that for the people that like to collect stuff and spend money and like are into fashion and things like that, I think they've become a lot more mainstream than before because you could access the information a lot easier. And so um, it's, it's probably in the last decade that it's shifted to becoming like a much more of a thing. Because back in the day too, you know, like in the, like in the, in 2007, I was like, I'm a watch dealer, and people are like, what, I don't even understand what that is, or why is that a profession, so. So how did you, how did you learn about these watches back, back then? Because I know today we have, there's online guides, there's plenty of pictures, there's reference checks, but where are you, where, how, are you, how were you cutting your teeth back then? Um, it was much easier to find the pieces and sort of there were already forums where people were sort of like separating out like what serial numbers should be in, what version of dial should be in a serial number range. Um, but also too, it was just much easier to actually physically get them in your hands because Paul Newman's weren't really expensive. Red subs weren't expensive. They were only a few thousand dollars. And, and because you, we had the volume of actually being able to hold them and look at them, that's how we've evolved, right. um, just by seeing them. Because I think a lot of the people that are doing this now are sort of gaining experience through sort of reading stuff online and sort of also sometimes regurgitating in, in like information isn't correct. So, but before you would find a fresh watch from the original owner and then you would look at it, inspect it and see, and then you would do enough of that where sort of you started having your own guidelines of time frames of what things are acceptable and not. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, for most people that don't know, my first vintage watch uh, came from you and then that, actually opened up Pandora's box and allowed me to kind of get more and more into this. But I think there's something to be said about being able to touch, feel, look at it, uh, a watch in person versus, hey, here's 10 pictures of what a, a Mark I dial on a GMT is supposed to look like. Right? Yeah, I mean, and, and also too, even beyond that, like I think that really until you start wearing one and enjoying it and using it in your daily life, it doesn't really kind of hit, you know, when people treat these things as sort of like these very, mm -hmm kind of like distant kind of objects and, and you're not actually putting them on and seeing how they feel or how to use them and stuff like that, it doesn't really become real until then for me. Or, or I think even more importantly, until their skin in the game, like I, I didn't know anything about 1675 GMTs until I bought one. Yeah. And then once I got into it, I then dove in deep. You yeah. know? Well, same, I think for me too, like the way that people are like, oh, how do you learn about this? It's like we physically bought and sold them. And thankfully, there wasn't a lot of mistakes made, you know, along the way. But like when you you really wake up when you put all the money all the money that you own on the line to be able to buy something, you know, that forces you to be really really pay attention. So I think that's sort of one of the reasons why any dealer that is around that 
buy stuff for themselves and like invest their own sort of kind of like money and like and and kind of like spins the wheel for their like adventure on by themselves is much more interesting to me than a person that's like it just works for a company that just sort of like takes something and bring like buys it but they're not buying it with their own money they if like they bought something fake it didn't matter if they make a lot of money on it, it doesn't matter it there's doesn't not a, there's both physical and um it, it's just tangible at that point. That's their own skin on, on the line. Yeah, market. absolutely. Um, you know, we, we kind of go back and forth on this uh, this topic uh, about whether you know these watches that were essentially tool watches when they first came out, whether they've transcended into that kind of art territory because the prices that you're paying for some of these pieces are in that kind of category. Yeah, I think that you know, like as everything, as anything becomes like really precious, you could kind of say that. I don't know, like to me, there are moments where certain really, really interesting versions of watches kind of reach that level, but still, the great thing about them is like, they're not, you could still buy like a vintage watch for sort of around the same price as you can like a modern watch, like that, that like a retail of a modern watch. And so, the, there's things that have become like astronomical, but there's a lot of things that are still accessible. Um, well, art could be accessible too, sure. but I don't know, I, I, I don't, hasn't felt like that. Art for me has a special place in my heart because it's more complicated. And while this is, and I use that as an escape from like watches, um, maybe because this is so familiar, it doesn't still have that like, I don't know, that mystery to it. Because most of the stuff, like this stuff I know. So I, I can see that. It, it sounds, it, it's almost like we make our hobbies sometimes about the things that we want to learn or get into. Yeah. As opposed to have a mastery of, uh, of understanding. Yeah.